everybody, I'm Karen Hartglass. You are listening to It's All About Food, and here we are almost at the end of September. We've made it! Well done. And as we celebrate the end of September 2020, I am very excited to bring on my next guest. For the past three decades, Eric Adams has served the residents of Brooklyn as borough president, state senator, police officer, and coalition builder. In November of 2017, he was re-elected for a second term to represent Brooklyn as borough president. Born in Brownsville and educated in the city's public school system, he is committed to ensuring Brooklyn's bright future by helping each and every Brooklynite reach his or her full potential. And now he's written a new book, Healthy at Last, a plant based approach to preventing and reversing diabetes and other chronic illnesses. I have Eric here to talk about it right now. Eric, how are you doing? Quite well, quite well. Great to see you and I'm so happy you're allowing me to talk with your listeners. Well, I spoke with you two years ago. I came to Brooklyn Borough Hall and the best part of it was I was able to give you a hug. (laughs) <laughs> well, you were able to give me a hug. And we're not doing much hugging right now, which is a serious problem. <laughs> yes, human interaction is so important. It is, and it's very difficult with the coronavirus, but I believe we'll get through it. Before we get started in talking about your wonderful book, Healthy at Last, A Plant-Based Approach to Preventing and Reversing Diabetes and Other Chronic Illnesses, which I read and I love, <laughs> I want to start the way I usually end, which is acknowledging a few people. I'm really grateful for Rachel Atchison for setting this interview up and all that she is doing with you at Brooklyn Borough Hall. She's amazing. And she's so committed to, you know, just saving life. And that's important. And then uh, my friend Jean Stone also helped with the writing of the book. I just wanted to say hello to Jean and shout out to him. And, and he's, a, he's a good person and just, you know, during a time that we sat down and had an opportunity to put my ideas together, it was just a wonderful experience. So one of the things I learned when I spoke with you a couple of years ago, many people have learned and heard about you is your story. And we get to hear about it in, in a lot more detail in the book. But just for, for those who don't know, can you give us a brief summary of your tale, your journey? from diabetes to looking really hot in a suit. (laughs) (laughs) And and we all have uh, similar stories. If you're part of the, you know, the American diet and lifestyle, and one way or another is going to impact you through depression, through a chronic disease, and it impacted me. And, And now I understood why it was told that at a certain age, you should start taking certain tests. Because we know after consuming an American diet and lifestyle, when you get 50, uh, this is going to happen to you. When you get 60, this is going to happen to you. And it's almost amazing that we know that and we built it into our system of sick care. I don't even like to call it health care. And so at 56, uh, I I started experiencing, you know, vision loss in my left eye and and in my right, nerve damage in my hands and feet. And even I had an ulcer, high blood pressure, high cholesterol. And my body just was breaking down right on cue, as we were told. And when I went to my doctor, he basically, he was on cue. He gave me the drugs that my mother was taken, that my dad was taken, my aunts were taken. And so it was on cue. And it was only because of great doctors that understood the power of wellness that they discovered outside of the the institutions that were supposed to be teaching wellness that I was able to reverse my diabetes and reverse the nerve damage, the ulcer, uh, the vision loss, all through a whole food plant-based diet. You were blind and now you see. Well said. Literally and (laughs) figuratively, right? Well said. There's a number of lines in the book. I'm going to pull them out because I really like them. One of it was, when it comes to fighting all cancers, the color of your skin doesn't matter. The color of your food is what counts. Uh, Well said, yes. And, And that beautiful 
visual color of food, the reds, the orange, the different deep colors. Once you start to see clearly, you start to appreciate the diversity of nature and how it has allowed us to just enjoy uh, the beauty of food and the taste of food. And you're right, it's not the color of your skin, it's the color of your food, and far too often uh, we ignore the color of our food. We are so much better off, not only with diversity in our food, with colorful food, but in diversity in everything on the planet, diversity in people, diversity in different life species, diversity in different plant species. We are a healthier planet with more color and more diversity. Imagine having a garden and you only have one flower that's bland and it takes up the entire garden. There are reasons that flowers come in different colors, shapes mm. and sizes, just like people come in different shades of skin tone and skin pigmentation and even ideas. Uh, we have lost our ability to engage in exchanging ideas. Uh, you know, when you lost the desire to sit down and to, to disagree without being disagreeable. The greatest discoveries in humankind took place because we pushed back against the norm to create the unknown. And that really allowed us to cycle into some of the great things we have done. And so that diversity is important. If we sit in a room and everyone is thinking the same, doing the same things, listen to the same music, eating the same food, we are really experiencing a Shakespearean tragedy of why diversity is so important. Yeah, it's either a comedy or a tragedy. It's a tragedy <laughs> if people die. So true. <laughs> We're talking about food, but it's bigger than food. And you're, you brought up such a great point. We're in a society right now that is so polarized. We cannot have conversation. Everybody's on one side or the other side. There's no compromise. There's no coming together. There's no listening. There's no hearing. And we're suffering as a result. We are. We are. And even in families, you know, I know families that uh, stop, you know, going to family gatherings because we are so polarized that it, reach, it has reached our children. And I'm concerned, you know, when we look at what's happening nationally, I don't worry about the national leaders as much as I'm worrying about what's happening to us as human beings. Uh, because national leaders will come and go. But we are still here, even after uh, they leave the residue of bitterness in our communities and in our hearts. Uh, when they're gone, that bitterness is still there. And that's what the book really touched on. It touched on how do we find our full personhood? How do we uh, look at uh, the everything we do to our bodies also impacts the anatomy of our spirit. And you can't have a healthy body in an unhealthy spirit, and you can't have a healthy spirit in an unhealthy body. It's a yin and yang, and they go together. And that is what I wanted people to see in the book, Healthy at Last. Well, you definitely bring up the importance of family and how all the people in your family have supported your journey and joined you on your journey. I don't know if everyone has, but a lot of people, it sounded like your mother benefited and others benefited. I like another thing that you wrote in the book, change your family's definition of love. Eat right. <laughs> yes, so true. You know, think about it for a moment. Uh, we sit down on those, those traditional holidays and before we eat, we pray for our aunties, our uncles uh, who are in the hospital going through a chronic disease that they may not be able to join us this Thanksgiving, this uh, Hanukkah, this Christmas. Uh, and without realizing that the food we're about to consume put them in the hospital and is going to put the people around the table in the hospital. My sisters and my siblings, uh, uh, they are experiencing breast cancer, experiencing uh, the loss of a kidney. Uh, my, my brother now is going through chemo. Uh, you know, we should not define our families based on uh, the medical crises that they are experiencing. And the book is, was a way of saying, we don't have to live this way. And I, we're clear, it's not being 
uh, immortality. Because we know part of the contract of life states that, you know, there's a beginning, a middle, and a conclusion, and it ended. But the quality of life, I don't want to live to be 120 and I can't recognize my grandchild. Mm -hmm. I don't want to live long just to uh, be unable to uh, take three hours a day, three days a week to go to dialysis. All of these things are preventable and in many cases reversible. And I wanted to show that in the book. Well, I read it and I really enjoyed it. It was a really easy read and I appreciate that because you explain a lot of things, science and health and food and why we want to eat plant foods, whole foods. And you did it in a way that is so easy to digest, I like to say. <laughs> and that was the goal. I, I wanted to feel as though I was sitting in someone's living room or on someone's front porch on a nice warm summer day and we were just engaging in the conversation. I didn't want it to be a textbook. I didn't want it to be that I was talking down to anyone. I wanted people to see uh, that there's nothing perfect about me merely because I am a borough president. Uh, I've made so many mistakes. I always say that uh, on one's resume, there should be a place where you put all your errors because you're not defined by the things you achieved. You're defined by the mistakes you've made and you got up and continued anyway. And that's what I wanted to show in the book, that there is a place for all of us to continue to evolve and find the purpose that you're really looking for in life. And you do it by ensuring that you're healthy and being healthy at last. So many of us don't even know what it's like to feel healthy. I, I say that all the time. You don't know how good you can feel. You just don't know. And we yes. accept so many aches and pains. It's like normal. It's not normal. It isn't. In the book, you go into history. History primarily about the Africans that were brought to the United States as slaves and what they had to endure, the food they had to eat, and how that has rolled into the future. We don't hear enough about that. We don't hear enough of all the history that occurred in this country that we need to make Reconcile peace with. with. Right. Reconcile. Right. Right. Yeah. Right. Atonement. Atonement. Absolutely. You know, coming to reconciliation. And in South Africa, they did the Truth and Reconciliation uh, Commission because when you move forward, you have to acknowledge the deeds of the past and not to live in the past, but to acknowledge them so you could evolve out of them whole in a whole way. And the narrative that I did in a book was not only the African American experience, but if you follow the trace of what has happened in the colonies and colonization all over the globe, just look at Hawaii. Hawaii with mm -hmm. all the fresh fruit and vegetables they have, uh, the colonizers went in and they incorporated spam in their diets. And that has, been, that has become a staple of the Hawaiian diet. And you look at their numbers of heart disease, of diabetes, and same thing in Central and South America. Uh, they can't even consume the food that they grow in their own country. It is being exported out. Yep. And so the story of the African-American experience and handing down those recipes from generation to generation that leads to the destruction of the body and the mind from Alzheimer's and dementia is a story that is really, it could be duplicated in any other uh, country that colonizers went in and changed the culture and the food. The human species has a lot of problems. <laughs> 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 but I'm hopeful and I want to think that we are ultimately going to move to a better place. We're going through some difficult times right now with our federal government, elections coming up, things are very tense. A lot of us are living in high anxiety. And then I think of Eric Adams and, and the Brooklyn Borough and all the wonderful things you're doing there. It gives me hope, I feel like I can breathe. It's just wonderful to know that there are people out there that care mm. and are doing good. So thank and, you for that. And, it's, and, and we should be, excited because I truly believe that we are, the universe is in a shift and there's almost a global awakening that's taking place. Uh, the mere fact that you and I are using 
<laughs> this method of communication to talk about healthy eating. Maybe a pre-med student is going to hear your podcast and go into medical school with the thought of real wellness instead of just sick care, but health care. Maybe, they, maybe this book will sit on someone's coffee table at the time that a person comes from the hospital with a diagnosis and start flipping through it or sitting inside a doctor's office and the book is there on one of the chairs and they start flipping through it before they're told they have to go on insulin. So I think there's a great possibility out of all of this darkness. I don't think we're buried. I believe we're planted. And I think the fruits of my harvest is went into the book. And I think that what we're doing right now, people are going to hear what we're talking about. And they're going to know there's a better way uh, to live our lives and deal with chronic illnesses. I like that image of that we're planting. Mm. I really <clears throat> like that. Yes. Thank you. I need these good images and I need to hear these good things. You don't just talk about food. You talk about lifestyle. You talk about the importance of movement and exercise and all of these things add up to a healthy life. I also like that you say laughing and smiling is important and to start and end your day with a smile and a laugh. Yes, so true. And I wanted to redefine the definition of exercising. People often think, oh, I don't have time to go to the gym. I don't have time uh, to do all of these things. Uh, it's amazing that how much we have in our control. And I always tell people, just take a moment and think, what percentage of the things you were worried about actually materialize? Mm. <laughs> we, we, we regret the life we live. We're afraid of the life that's ahead of us. So when are we in the present? If we live 50% of our lives, fear in the future, upset at the past, we're never in the present. And so I wanted to show people in the book how you can do simple things to exercise. So you don't need a gym pass. You don't need a bike or you don't need an exercise machine. Take the stairs, walk, stand, have a standing desk. You know, get off the bus stop, one stop before yours and walk to your destination. You know, park your car several blocks from your houses of worship and walk there. And don't try to, instead of trying to find a space right in front of your office or right in front of your store, Walk a little, carry your bags two or three blocks to get that exercise in. And so I wanted to show people how you can take control of your everyday interactions and have a place in how you make yourself healthy at last. Well, we've definitely been programmed perhaps to look for the convenience in life. Yes, yes, and, so true. And it's not good for us. It's not. It's yeah, not. I live in Queens. Uh, now, I haven't gone grocery shopping in six months. I'll confess. <laughs> I get everything delivered now, and it's nice, but I'm doing it because I'm staying inside. Right, right, right. But we have a Trader Joe's not far from here and a grocery store about 20 minutes away, and we used to always walk and carry some pretty heavy bags because it was right. full of plants. Right, right. <laughs> and it was, it was a workout. Right. And, and, you know, really, and that's what I wanted to show in a book. Think about what we are becoming. We're becoming isolationists. We're creating this new environment where we communicate through Twitter, Facebook, or Instagram. We're not in the supermarkets where we may see Miss Jones from down the block and talk about how are things going in your garden. Uh, we, we're not even in uh, the places that we normally socialize. And we, when we cycle out of COVID, how, much of, uh, how many of us are going to cycle out of the isolation that we're living in? Or have we, have we normalized being isolated? That's the real concern. And I, wanted in, and I wanted to show in the book that how do we really start healing? That's why I talk about meditation. I talk about taking time. I talk about breathing, something mm -hmm. that we do every day, all day, but no one has actually stopped to teach us how to breathe correctly. Yeah. You know, I talk about the power spices, 
and how important spices are, not just salt and pepper. And I really wanted to bring people into a place of saying an aha moment. And that's what I was hoping to accomplish. No, I think you accomplished that and much more. On the subject of breathing, which I like to talk about a lot on this program, and we like to say we breathe for a living. (laughs) (laughs) When the pandemic started, we talked a lot about breathing exercises, and we learned that people that were going through the illness, that doing breathing exercises, really vigorous ones, even though it may have been difficult, was very helpful and important in overcoming the virus. Yes. To strengthen your lungs and open your passageway, we need to learn how to breathe. Yes, yes, yes. And it should be, it should be incorporated in our traditional settings, such as schools. Mm -hmm. Part of the curriculum should be teaching people self-care. We should give instructions on meditation. We should give instructions on breathing. We should give instructions on uh, how to really find inner peace. We have a collective collective audience in our schools. It should be more than just young people being academically smart. They should be emotionally intelligent. And that is going to define uh, who we are. I was in Bhutan uh, a a few years ago, and they don't look at a, they don't determine the health of their country by the gross national product. They do it by happiness. Yep. And, and, and we are looking at the wrong things to determine if we're healthy as a country. We should be looking at how strong are our families? How happy are we every day? Uh, how much is our human interactions? But that is how we need to start defining ourselves. We have to unlearn what we learn so we can learn how to be whole again. I agree with you. And you're the kind of leader I want for <laughs> my city and my country. we're we're in this together we're going to continue to grow together yes just a few more things and then i'll let you go because i know you're working really hard and i don't want to take too much of your time you talk about not drinking soda anymore and that your choice is water sometimes you go for seltzer and sometimes you drink cold brew tea and you even eat the leaves Yes, (laughs) Yes, <laughs> uh, right. You know, <laughs> and, and, but but imagine imagine having collard greens, and you only drink the juice from the collard greens, and you throw out the collard greens, or or you only drink the juice from kale, and you throw out the kale. There's a lot of nourishment in those leaves, and I use uh, sometimes when I make my soup, I will open uh, a couple of bags of green tea and put it inside, or hibiscus tea, uh-huh. and put it inside. And you can eat the leaves. They're not poisonous. You know, right. we, we think that the leaves are poisonous. If the leaves are, poison, leaves are poisonous, then the tea was poisonous. Right. <laughs> you know? So yes, I do. I, I love to you know, put the leaves and drink the, the leaves down with the tea. I love it, because I don't like wasting anything. <laughs> so I was, I was very excited, because for some reason, I never thought of doing that. (laughs) But you know, you talk about drinking the juice from the collards and and not eating the leaves. People will cook vegetables, eat the vegetables, and then there's the steaming water or the boiling water. Right. We need to drink that. All the vitamins are in there, right? right. That's right. (laughs) So true, you know. Okay, so you have this wonderful book, Healthy at Last. I love it. I'm so glad that you saw the light you can see, you got well, everything's wonderful. And can you just talk a little bit about what you're doing in terms of food and nutrition in Brooklyn? I know that just today, Rachel shared the nutrition education for physicians and health professionals policy opportunities for New York. And that was exciting to read. I read that very quickly before talking with you. Such a good report because we have to change our institutions. I can't tell someone what to put on their grill in the backyard or what they put on their kitchen or dining room table. But government should not be using taxpayers' dollars to feed crisis. We should not be serving poisonous food in our schools, 
in our hospitals, in our correctional facilities, in our different places that we feed people. We should be using those opportunities to introduce people to healthy food and healthy food choices, particularly in the time of coronavirus. Uh, we should have used the opportunity that we serve millions of meals. They should have been healthy meals, not meals that, that depleted the immune system, but actually strengthened the immune system. So we have been doing some amazing work. We were, we were successful in convincing the city uh, to take processed meat out of our city. We're no longer buying and purchasing processed meat. We have a great program at Bellevue Hospital, the first of its kind of lifestyle medicine with amazing doctor, Dr. McMackin. We moved the schools to do Meatless Mondays and our hospitals to do Meatless Mondays. So we're really moving people towards giving them choices, not dictating, not telling people what they can do or can't do, but to give them the information, the education, so they can make smart choices. And that is what I believe government must do. Woo, everybody applaud, you're awesome. <laughs> this is what I wanna hear from all of my representatives. <laughs> so important. Okay, the book doesn't only talk about your life and some history behind food, and why it's important to eat plants and the science behind it. But we also have some wonderful, delicious recipes at the end. Some of them are yours, and then you have uh, many wonderful contributions. I was scanning some of them, and uh, I got hungry. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. But some really beautiful recipes. I'm just going to wrap this up, and thank you so much. Thank for you. taking Thank the time. You. I really hope that I get to see you in person sometime and grab another hug. <laughs> <laughs> I look forward to do it as well. And be safe, be healthy, yes. and enjoy. We will get through this all together. Thank you very okay, much. Okay, thank you. Good night. Bye-bye. That was Eric Adams, everyone. Wow. And here's what I have to say about it, or sing about it. At last... My help has come along, my sickly days are over, and life is like a song, oh yeah, healthy at last, yeah. All right, now, Gary DiMatte, come wow. on board. Wow is right. That was awesome. You wrote that song for Eric. Yeah, I modified the words, yes. Right. You wrote those lyrics for Eric. You did yeah. something else for Eric, too. What's that? You invented a recipe. I think there's a love affair going on here. <laughs> I said this last time, and I think okay, I'm right. I, I, I and love And I think, him. you know what? Confess, baby. All right. Well, I think he's awesome. Yeah. And I would like him as my next mayor of New York City. Absolutely. Who wouldn't want a, wow. a plant-based mayor of New York City? I mean, everybody should. To promote plant foods to I, all the children in the schools and all the people in the hospitals and prisons and everywhere. Oh my gosh, he was, he was amazing. Wow, this is a great interview. The book is Healthy at Last. The song was beautiful, Karen. Thank of course, you. You've doctored the lyrics to At Last. Yes, the real song. At Last was written by Etta James, the great Etta James. Written and sung by. Yes. Yeah. Anyway, listen to what some of the people are saying about this book. First okay. of all, some of the people that read this book and reviewed it, unbelievable. Have I you, know. Have you read some of these? Uh, yes, I have. Did you read them out loud to the... I have not. Okay. Go for it. Let's start with Reverend Al Sharpton. My favorite. Yeah. I can personally attest to the truth Eric shares within the pages of Healthy at Last. Eric's book will empower you to change your life and the lives of those around you. Now, Al Sharpton is also a vegan. He is, and I wanna say he's huge, huge, but he used to be huge, and now he's a little peanut. Now he's very tiny. Cause he eats flat foods. Yeah, he's awesome. He's always been awesome, but now he's, he's tiny and awesome. Yes, we but like that. Still very powerful. Yes. Dean Ornish, MD, heart disease, type 2 diabetes, early stage prostate cancer, hypertension, and other chronic diseases may often be reversed and prevented by changing diet and lifestyle. In this important and compelling book, Eric Adams describes how. 
Highly recommended. That was Dean Ornish. Wow. And there's just so many others that have praised this book. Buy the book. Buy the book and give it to your doctors. Yes. That's what I have to say. It's great. Great program, Karen. Well done. Thank you. You also invented a recipe, which I was privileged to take part in eating. So what happened was this interview with Eric Adams was pre-recorded. I recorded it last week and we were supposed to speak in the morning and I got up and it was early and folks, you've got to know, I don't like getting up early. Gary and I are artists. We get up late. We go to bed late. Anyway, I got up early because I had an interview with Eric Adams and he's a busy guy, super busy in meetings all day. And at the last second, He couldn't make the interview, so we scheduled it for later in the evening, and he did it at 8.30 at night. This is after a long day of stuff. So I was very moved that he did that. And we had this wonderful conversation, which you just heard. And then afterwards, I needed a treat. And so you invented this amazing recipe. And after looking at some of the recipes in his book, I was inspired. So there was a recipe for a brown rice pudding that had a little cardamom in it. So I had cardamom in my mind. And then there was another very simple recipe for truffles. But when we talk about truffles, we're talking about the kind made from fruit and nuts that you grind up in a food processor and then make little balls out of. Mm -hmm. So this particular recipe, I think it had cocoa in it, a couple of other ingredients. And so I wanted to make those with a little cardamom in it, kind of mixing up some of the flavors I was reading about in the book. But it was at night, and I didn't want to make it with cocoa powder because we're both sensitive to caffeine. But we have carob. And okay, folks, you've heard me say this. You should never use carob when you want chocolate. They have very different flavors. But I thought I should try the carob with some dates and some other ingredients and a little cardamom. See what happens. You're going to post the recipe, Yes, it had a little coconut in it. The dog likes it. (laughs) We have a dog now. (laughs) We actually have several dogs. Yeah, out in the park. So it has dates, carob. I put a little chia seeds in it, walnuts, coconut, vanilla, and cardamom. And you rolled it in coconut. I rolled it in coconut, too. There's both coconut in it and then rolled, kind of looks like sprinkles. It makes it fun. Yeah. It was really quick to make, really easy. We devoured them. They were fantastic. And what did you name these? And then I named them. Are you ready, folks? You have to do it in a Brooklyn accent. I named them, forget about it. No, I named them Brooklyn Borough Balls. (laughs) Brooklyn Borough Balls. What else would you call them? I mean, that's so much fun to say. (laughs) Brooklyn Borough Balls in honor of Eric Adams. And the Borough of Brooklyn. And the Borough of Brooklyn. Yay, forget about it. They were fantastic. Yes, and they're gone. These Brooklyn Borough Balls. I mean, the way you say balls. No no one can say balls the way you say balls. (laughs) Thank you, Gary. Say it again. It's taken a lifetime. Well, you're a New Yorker. In the right place. Brooklyn Borough Balls. 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 I mean, that's brilliant. (laughs) It's brilliant. Forget about it. Forget about it. These were delicious Brooklyn Borough Balls. Brooklyn named, Borough Balls. And they're my favorite of kind of dessert, Adams. actually. When you grind up fruits and nuts, dried fruits and nuts, it makes the most spectacular sweet treat. One more time. Brooklyn Borough Balls. Brooklyn say. Borough Balls. That was, Brooklyn that's Borough great. Balls. That's great. You know, it's one of our favorite things to do is to go into Manhattan and go to Westerly and get some of those... Date rolls oh, yeah. rolled in coconut, and these were even better. Thank you, Gar. These were better. All right. Yeah. Well, it's a good thing because we haven't been to Westerly in over six months. Yeah, but we're going to go on Thursday, right? Yes, we've made a commitment to... Head into Manhattan on Thursday. Yeah, we'll report on it next week. Yeah. We're going to brave... We're going to brave the... We're going to brave this uh, situation uh, we're all in, and... A lot of people are getting out, though. That's really kind of a yes, cool Yes, a thing. lot of people are, and we want to be a part of that. Of course. We live here. We should start venturing out. We should start living, living with masks living on. Living with masks. Yeah. We were just in the park the other day, had a little bike ride. I saw signage everywhere that said, 
If you're not wearing a mask, stay six feet apart. People seem to be complying. There were like maybe half of the people with masks and half of the people without masks. I know that the schools are going to come back into session soon, mm-hmm. right? And for those of you celebrating Yom Kippur. Yom Kippur, yeah, that Yom... just finished up a couple of days ago. If you were fasting and then broke fast, let's talk a little bit about fasting okay. because... You know, fasting for religious reasons is one thing, but people actually fast on purpose for health and medical reasons, right? I know you've talked about it on the show before, but... It's always good to talk about fasting. Yeah. I think to remind people about fasting because, frankly, I forget. Right. (laughs) I got to remind myself. Right. And one day, Gary, maybe we'll do a fast together. Oh, gee, that would be exciting. (laughs) I can't see that lasting long in our house, but yeah, okay. we like eating, but I want to remind everyone that once upon a time, back about 21 years ago, I did a three-week water-only fast, and I found it a very enjoyable experience. The funny thing was, I did the first half, so the first 10 days, I did at home. And then Dr. Furman at the time had a fasting house where he had people come to fast and he would monitor us. And so the second half was at this house. And it was in a place in New Jersey, which was near one of these um, outdoor malls with stores all around. And one of the stores was a Pyrex store, a Corning store. Corning, right. And I used to walk out of the fasting house and go for a walk. Now I was at a very slow pace. Right, because I would imagine. everything yeah. slows down. Right. <laughs> and it's supposed to slow down because you're supposed to be resting and letting your body naturally cleanse and detoxify. But I would go and I would go into this corning store and buy stuff for my kitchen. So I wasn't eating, but I was thinking about, oh, I guess I was thinking about food. and I would imagine you were thinking a lot about food when you fast. The fascinating thing is, this is the honest truth, because folks, I only tell the truth. After two days, your body starts feeding on its own non-essential stores. And we all have plenty of non-essential stores in our bodies. And you're not hungry. So apparently it takes two days for women and three days for men. I imagine that it's a little different per individual. But when you're doing a long-term fast, you will not be hungry after the first few days. Really? And it's true. You're just not hungry. And what's the purpose of fasting? What happened was I read Dr. Furman's book, Fasting and Healing for Health. I think this was his first book. Mm -hmm. I recently told him he should put a revision out or an anniversary edition because people are now talking more and more about fasting. And it was such a great book. And I just got the idea that I should fast because he was recommending that people should just fast every five to 10 years, like as a cleansing or a detox, even if you're eating the healthiest you possibly can. We're living in an environment that's a disaster. And we get stuff in our bodies that doesn't belong. And our bodies are pretty good if we treat them well at detoxing. We do it all the time. And that's why sleep is so important because that's when a lot of it happens and we rejuvenate and detox, all that stuff. But he was recommending once every five years to do a water fast. And it could be a week, could be two weeks. Where you just go for two weeks without anything but water. Without anything but water. And then there are people that are going through a health crisis and a water fast isn't appropriate for all health crises and I'm not the one who's going to tell you if you should do it or not you should consult a doctor consult a doctor who is an expert in water fasting like Dr. Furman or Dr. Alan Goldhammer at the True North Health Center in California but it can be very beneficial and very healing very quickly for a lot of people who are experiencing something very traumatic because I remember it was either in Furman's book or Dr. Shelton's book, which is also an old book on fasting. Somebody told the story about if you look in nature and see what animals do when they're hurt or wounded, very often they just go 
somewhere where they can rest and they just lap up a little water as they can. They fast until they heal. And what happens is the body shuts down a lot of its functions or slows them down and is able to focus on the areas that need healing. There have been stories of people with tumors, let's say, and they fast and the tumors get smaller or disappear because the body kind of digests them. It's not a cure-all for everything, but people are realizing today, as opposed to 20 years ago, that fasting is health-promoting. Well, that's, that makes sense because you're feeding your tumors if you're eating the wrong food. Eating the right diet, a plant-based diet, can actually... Help your body fight the tumor. Fight the tumor. Yeah. That makes sense. It's funny, funny, sad. When I did my fast about 20 years ago, the people that I told I was doing it were all very up in arms. Like, oh my God, that's so dangerous. What are you doing? Now it's a lot more accepted because it really isn't dangerous. And everybody would say, you're going to starve. Everybody or just your mom? No, everybody. Oh, really? Everybody I talked to. Okay. Everyone. You, you were imitating okay. your mom just now. It's so. true. Mom, I'm doing your voice. <laughs> but I'm sure, she, I'm sure she protested as well. Of course she did. That's because she loves you. Yes. There's so many things that we do to our bodies that are so damaging. And, and doctors, they don't bat an eye because they don't know or they don't think that they can convince you to do otherwise. I don't know what it is. Even in, in Eric Adams' book, he talked about a f friend of his who was in a health crisis. And he spoke to him about diet. And when the guy talked to his doctor... He wanted to know what his doctor thought of a plant-based diet. The doctor never recommended it to Eric's friend. But then the doctor said, yeah, I think it can help. I do it. But the doctor never recommended it to his patient because he didn't think he'd do it. And wow. there's a lot of that going around. Buy Eric's book and give it to your doctor, everybody. Yeah. Healthy at last, Eric Adams. If we have anything to say about it, he will be the next mayor of New York City. So fasting, again... There's water fasting, and that's what I'm talking about. But there's other kinds of fasting. There's juice fasting. And that can be beneficial, too, just to simplify what you're putting in your body. But another thing about fasting that's fascinating. That's fascinating. That's fascinating, exactly, is if you are choosing chemotherapy as an option for cancer treatment. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying I recommend it. I'm not saying I don't. I think it may be appropriate in some cases, not appropriate in others. That's for you and your doctors and your experts and your circle to decide. But some recent studies have shown that if you fast the day before getting chemo and during chemo, the chemo will be more effective. Wow. Yeah, that's, that's big. That's big. Yeah. That's big news. So there's a lot of benefits to fasting. So this is not the same thing as what just happened for Yom Kippur. You know. <laughs> right? Because after a day of fa after 24 hours of fasting, what's traditionally, what do people eat? Oh, I'm so glad you brought that up. Right? Because, okay, so after, <laughs> after a health fasting, like the Dr. Furman kind of mm -hmm. fasting, you're supposed to just eat little tiny bits of food after you fast. Especially right? if it's a long fast. Right, right, right. But, right. A, but any fast where you're doing it for health purposes, mm -hmm. when you start to refeed, you don't want to be refeeding with food that isn't good for you. Then there's no point in fasting and it can actually be more dangerous. Okay. So what just happened with the religious fast of Yom Kippur? A lot of people traditionally, after they break... Well, it's party thing. time. They, they don't do this thing eat... called break fast, right? Yes. Which is like breakfast. Well, break fast. it's in the evening when the sun right. goes down right. where but they break fast. That's just means... But you know, that's what breakfast means. Breakfast We're means... supposed to be fasting and then we break the fast in the right. morning. Right, right. And I know that you don't like to eat anything 12 hours before. We recommend intermittent fasting where there's at least 12 hours, more is better, 16 hours between your last meal of the day and your first meal of right. the next day. Let's say you go to bed at midnight, you should get up at noon. <laughs> well, not get up, but not eat until, not eat until noon. noon or 2 o'clock. Right. And guess what? That's what we do most of the time. Hey, works for us. It does. We get up, 
We have a little We tea. don't wake up at noon. No, we, wake we don't up wake up at noon. We wake up at 8. We get a, 8 hours if we go to bed at 12. Right, right. And get up, and then we have a little beverage, a tea. We'll go for a walk or do an exercise or whatever. And then by the time it's 1 o'clock, we're ready to make a meal. So get back to now breaking fast for Yom yes. Kippur. So rather than breaking fast from a health-promoting, a therapeutic type of fast, Dr. Furman would give you... Steamed zucchini, maybe a half of a zucchini steamed the first day you're breaking a long fast. Now that's if you have a long fast, but you want to start up slowly because your digestion has stopped. Maybe a little watermelon. You start slowly with a little food and very juicy food and no salt. No salt for a very long time, if ever, because that can really be damaging. As opposed to after the Yom Kippur holiday, and I have participated in many a break fast, and Gary, you've been to a few with me. As a vegan, though, so I never ate anything. Well, we brought something. I mean, a there was times, always fruit, yeah. But, but, but the was... food that is laid out after a Yom Kippur fast is not healthy, and it's as much as you can eat. Yeah, there's a lot of heavy-duty food there. A lot of heavy-duty food. Like bagels and cream cheese and lox and... And cakes and... Yeah. Yeah. Just a real big party. Yeah. Yeah, it's a big party of food. I remember when I was coming off of my fast at Dr. Furman's Fasting Center, he had someone there who was monitoring all of us because Dr. Furman wasn't there full time. He had his own practice. Was this in the fasting room or the fasting house? It was a fasting house. Is yes. that is that kind of like a panic room? <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. I know we need a lot of those these days. No, it was room. an actual house. Were people just panicking and crabby? And There were people who were crabby. Yeah. Absolutely. But I remember That's he a... gave me my steamed zucchini, my half of a zucchini, And I'm like, that's it? (laughs) And then the next day, or maybe it was later in the day, I forget, they had to carefully give you small amounts of food to get things going again. And as soon as I started eating, I was starving. (laughs) (laughs) And I looked at him, can't you give me more food? I was a crazed woman. He did give me a little more food. Not too much. That's a New Yorker cartoon, (laughs) I think. People in a fasting room. It, there's something to that. You know, I always think of the people who don't have enough food to eat, period, looking at people who go on long fasts and think about all of the privilege involved sure. with things like fasting. Sure. And I'm going on a two week water fast. Yes. You know, then I'm going to the spa afterwards. There is a bit of privilege there. There are different shades of fasting. There is the religious fasting. Right. And even the religious fasting, some of it. Some of the people who fast are truly fasting for the right reasons. And what is that reason? Why are you supposed to fast? I was taught when I was in Hebrew school right. that you were supposed to be so profoundly deep in prayer uh, that, that you didn't have time to think about food. Gotcha. And I was also told that sipping of water was okay. Right. And then it morphed into you can't have anything. And 24 hours without anything, no water. Yes. And I don't agree with that. Won't your kidneys shut down? Not after one day, but it's not really a good thing to do. But most of the people that I know that were fasting, that's all they were thinking of was food. So there's a little twist there. But there are religious folks or spiritual people that do regular fasts as a ritual and find it useful spiritually, spiritually not just physically but sure there are also people that pay a lot of money mm-hmm. to go to a place not to eat exactly i'm sorry yeah i have a problem with that yeah but speaking of drinking i'm drinking a lovely tea right now with ruibos and chai that's right oh. i like to call it chai ru mm-hmm. chai ru it's really lovely i highly recommend Folks out there, get some ribos and some and chai, chai and mix it together. Okay, so fasting, I'm okay with it. but You're, you're not going to go for a fasting vacation with me anytime no, soon? No, I, I don't think so. I don't think so. <laughs> I like the idea of doing our intermittent fasting. That really works for me. Yeah. And I think, you know, I'm not going to uh, condemn anyone's religion. I think if it works for you religiously... 
a two week fast. I don't know. I don't think I could do it. And I didn't think I'd want to do it. A lot of people who feel that they need to do it, I'm sure it works for them. Unfortunately, some people do it to lose weight. Right. And I'm not a big believer in diets, as you know. I know. That's really not the best way to lose weight. No. Because you should know the proper way to eat before you start fasting. Well, sometimes it takes a lifetime. And I know it took me a lifetime to figure out, and as I always say, make peace with my food. We're always learning, Gary. Yeah. But it seems like another gimmick to me. What's that? Fasting. I want you to read this book, Gary. Yeah, Fasting what is and Eating for Health, a Medical Doctor's Program for Conquering Disease, Joel Furman, MD. Look, I know you really, really believe in Dr. Joel Furman, and I like the guy a lot. Don't you want to live forever? <laughs> and I do. I have to read that book. But I'm a skeptic. Actually, I saw him speak first and bought the book. Right. He's a dynamic speaker. Yeah, this was 1995. Wow. A long time ago. Right. Now, I'm sure people who have medical problems and have had great results with fasting will beg to differ with me. So mm -hmm. that's fine. I like a nice... A nice spirit, spirited argument. Spirited argument. Yeah, we have spirited arguments here at Responsible Eating and Living. We, have, we do. Yeah, sure. There's nothing wrong with that. No. We're, we're not always in alignment. No. And no. I think that's fine. I think we are a good balance. Yes. You've gone in a lot of different directions with food. Since I've known you for 12 years. Sure. You started by eating foods that had salt and oil and sugar and wheat. And then you did some research and then you got off the wheat. Your body was reacting negatively to it. And then you got off of oil and salt and mostly all sugar. And so little by little, I've gone with you on this journey. It's only made me feel a hundred million times better. As you kick and scream along the sure, way. Sure, <laughs> I, I, as, I as I throw many tantrums. Because you have to understand that being a new vegan and being a chef, at the same time, I had to reteach myself all of the things that I used to do, right? And I had to learn a whole new way of cooking. Basically, I had to learn a whole new way of living. It's been wonderful. All I can say is the journey's been wonderful. But at times, I'm probably crabby because I feel like I don't know this person anymore. And the I, person you were or the person I am that keeps no, changing. No, no, the person that I am turning into. Yes. I don't know this guy and sometimes... Who are you? Yeah. And sometimes <laughs> many people out there probably agree with me that, yeah, you start looking great and feeling great and you have all this energy, but then the old person that you were is still locked in your head somewhere and it there's a lot of very a lot someone of needs challenging to write a book stuff. about self self image that's when you, okay it's your book right no i think my book's title is going to be instead of fasting and eating for <laughs> health it's going to be slowing and, <laughs> and eating for health Okay. I think the key is to eat slowly. Eat, yes, eat slowly. Yeah. Yeah, really... we have to remind ourselves of that a lot too. Right, because I think as a vegan too, you just, like you said, as soon as the fast broke, you just wanted to eat. Yeah. Right? And eat vegans, me! At vegans, there's no guilt attached to what we eat, especially the way we eat. So we want to eat, and we want to eat now, and we want to eat a lot. A lot and fast. My most favorite dinners are the ones that... You know, where we have like 15 varieties of different foods. Like we have a smorgasbord on the table and we just keep piling things on. Speaking of eating fast and eating slow, because we do tend to eat on the fast side. This is all about play on words. Fasting and eating, eating fast. Eating fast. Yeah. Yes. Well, one thing leads to another. But you may remember, and I'm going to cry thinking about it, we had Thanksgiving dinner at Candle... 79. Yeah, last year. Before Candle 79 closed, yeah. before COVID-19 happened, and we haven't been in a restaurant ever since. Yeah, what a great but meal that was. We made a conscious effort to eat as slow as we possibly could. It was almost like we knew not only was Candle, our favorite restaurant in Manhattan, closing, uh, run and owned and operated by our favorite people, Benet and Joy and Bart and the whole staff there, who we miss terribly. But it was almost like we knew that in a few months, we weren't going to be able to go to a restaurant at all. Right. 
in the same not way just that. that one but all of them right but what a wonderful experience it was not just to be there when we slowed it down and we were so mindful about every bite it was a really enjoyable dinner yeah talk about everything slowing, slowing down. down it was really wonderful <laughs> Yeah, so you can slow down by just consuming water for a bunch of days, or you can right. make a conscious effort to take your time. Take your time, of course. And oh, that dinner, now that you brought it up, that was such a great dinner. Well, the other thing that made it special is we had a bottle of our favorite wine, Batar. Yes. Which is. Birchabella, our friend Seba, and his winery in Tuscany makes a biodynamic, vegan dynamic yes. wine. And one of them is batar. It's delicious. It's delicious. It's not something that we drink on a regular basis. It's a little bit pricey, but really lovely for a celebration. Yeah, and we could actually confess that we did buy a couple of bottles during the pandemic, and we still have one in there. That's right. We drank one, and we're saving the other. What are we saving it for? <laughs> I say we break it out right now. Right now. Okay. Right. It's only four o'clock in the afternoon, right? There you go. <laughs> All right. Are Let's, we wrapping uh, it up? We're wrapping it up. Hey, before we go, I just want to shout out to Joaquin Phoenix and Rooney Mara, who just had a baby vegan, and they're naming their baby River Aww. after Joaquin's late brother, River Phoenix. Oh, that's really Isn't lovely. That a little baby vegan named yeah. River. I mean, it's all you could find out more on all the vegan sites. I think it's just a really touching story. Fashion forward, the people at Doc Martens are joining with Mark Jacobs to bring a vegan Doc Martin boot out on the market, which I think is pretty cool. It's all decorated and Ooh. fancy stuff. It's made with vegan leather. Right on. There's but so they, much happening there. They sold out their first batch. Wow. Of, yeah. And we didn't get a pair. We didn't get a pair. So when we go to Manhattan on Thursday, we should go buy Moose Shoes and see if they have any. Okay. Yeah. Let's do that. I wonder if Moose Shoes is open. Well, we'll find out. Yeah. And we'll report back next week. Until then, everybody, have, have a, a delicious, delicious week. week.